Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to Geopolitics with Tiberius D. Today, by viewer request, I'm going to be doing a nation that I don't know the most about, but I'm definitely going to try to do my best and tag at it. Let's talk about Vietnam. Roll the intro. <laughs> All right, everyone, it's good to be back fixing the camera as we do. Um, so, Vietnam. This is not my specialization. Now, I try to deliver content when it's requested. So, um, we were going to do France and Britain next. But people were asking, hey, look, I want you to do this. I've got Vietnam, and I think there was one other nation that I was going to get. But we are going to do Vietnam and last back-to-back. Um, and we were going to miss the history episodes because I just don't know enough. And I'm just going to hit, hit you straight. I know a little bit here and there, but I actually know a little bit more about Cambodia and Thailand, but still I don't feel enough to do a, its own definitive history episode. So what little I do know about Vietnamese history, I'll talk a little bit about it here, but to a large degree, we're just going to get into the overview, what Vietnam is, how it works, why it works the way it does, and then go from there. So... Uh, if you are one of the people that asked me for this, I'm here to serve this to you. However, please, please forgive me if I might so happen to screw something up or have something that's not exactly in the full knowledge base. I'm going to try to refrain from talking about things that I may, may, may or may not know about. But if I make a mistake, please don't hang me. Because I did want, or did a video for a guy for Boston, and he absolutely was pissed. <laughs> that being said, I could have done a little better on that video, I'll admit it. So... Without further ado, let's get into this and talk about what or, or the good state, the good country of Vietnam. All right, so topography. Vietnam and geography is uh, got a bit of a problem. All right, looking at this from here is that it's a basically a natural harbor system for Southeast Asia. Got a lot of inlets, got a lot of rivers. However, two problems. One, most of these rivers are in tropical regions, and when you have rivers in tropical regions, is that they tend to be full of logs, and they tend to be full of like fauna that grows into the banks of the river, or even from the bottom of the river itself, and actually makes it far less navigable than it actually would. Also, you is that it has varied rainfall. Sometimes it'll almost be in a full constant flood state. Sometimes it'll be relatively slower and lower, but more often than not, you've got flood conditions in, in the, those kind of areas. And so definitely something that you want to be generally careful with if you're going to try to use a navigable river. Um, there's a lot of natural inlets here, particularly around the area that used to be Saigon, is that southern, the southern part is basically jutting into the tip of uh, the Indo-Pacific uh, to a little area that basically is a wonderful area to propagate power in. And you had a lot of powers very interested in colonizing the area, coming into the area, and setting up naval bases so they can project power into the rest of the region. And, uh, yeah, I mean, the French and the British definitely had some conversations about that. The French actually won out because the British got the other side. That's largely Borneo. Um, so they weren't too bad, too ha unhappy with it. And, they, and more important, they got the, cr the, creme, uh, the creme, creme de la creme, the key to the entire region, and that's Singapore. Uh, so the Brits won out more than they lost. Uh, what, what really comes in here is that this is a geopolitical... Uh, the tip is largely a geopolitical center point for the region. If you have some presence there, you can really screw with the Indo-Pacific, particularly the uh, the East Asian trade lanes to a large degree. And that's largely the trade lanes going from the Indian Ocean into the Pacific Ocean. Uh, those are incredibly important. That's actually where most of the fuel goes through right now and a lot of commodity traffic goes through. Uh, and that used to be the old spice routes and whatnot. So in a general sense, you control this area even back in the Imperial era you had a name for yourself. Um, so, geography, that's largely that. Next, we're going to be talking about the climate, since we already mentioned it. The, the southern part is largely terrible. Um, basically, the problem here is, in a nutshell, is that most of the country is in a tropical rainforest. And as we've talked about many, many times... Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> God, chat. Okay, anyway, ignoring chat for a minute here. Uh, yeah, the areas that are tropical rainforest, which is the bottom two-thirds and maybe the bottom three-fourths of the country, means that it is constantly raining and is going through these stages of... I, I don't know how you put this, right? The, the problem is, is that... It has tropical problems. It's too hot. It has a growing season that doesn't stop. And so you can grow quite a lot of crop, but it's full of pests. And you need pesticides. You need herbicides. And you actually usually have to de-lime, I'm sorry, or lime the, the um, excuse me, the ground because its acidity tends to build up pretty high. Uh, getting into the northern part, you actually get into some temperate areas. And it's actually some of the best land in the region because once you get into China, it's largely uh, some very geographically unstable areas, which we kind of saw on that previous map, is that it gets a lot more hill really hilly in northern Vietnam, particularly on the border and particularly in southern China, is that uh, it's not a place that you really want to live. And while this area is actually temporally known as temperate, uh, temperate dry winters and hot summers, is that really what this comes to be in is that it's basically subtropical. Um, and I'm actually surprised why it's labeled that. Because most of southern China is labeled subtropical. It might be in a certain weather belt that helps it to a little bit. But I don't know um, exactly where that goes over. If I have a mod in chat, feel free to start hitting warnings, please. That would be very appreciated. Okay. Uh, without further ado, moving into... Uh, to wipe out the geopolitical uh, geography part here. Vietnam's in a really bad spot. Uh, truthfully, because in reality here is what you have is that you have a very long insular nation that can be attacked from multiple sides. And even though it's from the sea to a large degree, is that if anyone has a boat, they can largely hit you at multiple points that you cannot universally defend against. The good news is against most of the other areas in the region, they can't really invade. Most of the, most of the border with Laos and the Laotians are relatively mountainous, hard to penetrate. And it's really hard for them to build out a collective entity themselves. Cambodia is to the south. And they have a lot of problems that the southern Vietnam has. So they largely have... Um, excuse me. They largely have their own problems that they have to intermix with and intermingle with. So largely they can either play on the same side or they can fight for resources. And more often or not, the Cambodians largely... And the Vietnamese have kind of largely agreed, at least from my understanding that they don't want to get in each other's way because there's enough on their plates as is. North Vietnam's a little pretty good. Now, it's been invaded in China multiple times over its history, but it's really hard for the Chinese to really propagate uh, propagate uh, power and influence into the region. And so, usually if the Chinese show up, they show up for a couple of years and they have to bail out because they can't afford it anymore. And so, at least in a general nutshell, Vietnam... Geopolitically speaking, like a two out of five. Needs, it just could be a lot better. Let's roll into the demography. Well, the good news for Vietnam is twofold. Number one is that the demography is pretty solid. It's got a lot of young people. It's got a lot of, um, it's got a growing population. And if you're looking to use the old, more capitalistic, uh, or even if you want to use a more socialistic view, worldview, they are set up to grow for the better part of the next couple of decades. And I saw the forecasts when I redid this particular slide. They're up about 2 million people, and they actually were expecting a bit of a birth fall off uh, for uh, the 2020 slot between 2015 and 2020. The preliminary numbers were actually that the birth rate was going to go down by a little bit, and we'd have less numbers. And even with COVID, we have actually a gr more growing population than what was forecast. And so if Vietnam is looking to maintain that, that is um, that is actually a pretty strong point for them. And they're doing okay. Um, I, don't, I, I do caution that they're having a little bit of the China problem with the sex imbalance here. That's almost a million people difference by sex imbalance. And that's uh, it's not necessarily something that you want when you're only 100 million people. Um, that can be a problem because what we, we've definitely seen what happens when young men get to the age of 30 and they don't have wives. They tend to get a little cray-cray. So uh, that largely hits the demography section real quick. Uh, I want to move into the economics. Well, this is a real shit kicker. Uh, a lot of the economic data obviously has problems because of the Vietnam War and basically the integration of North and South Vietnam. Here's the two takeaways. Number one, they are growing. For better or worse, they've been putting themselves in a better in a, in a spot 
Um, they've been putting themselves in a better spot to basically run their show in a more decent way. And of course, if you're looking at absolute numbers, they are growing. It's slow and steadily, and it's a healthy level of growth. Uh, and if you're working on PPP numbers, which be very careful with this one, because while the excuse me, while their system is particularly of its own accord, they don't really play by a lot of capitalistic rules and a lot of Western rules. They can metagame their currency in a particular way. And so they have definitely done that. But there's a real question on exact actually how much economic activity is going on within Vietnam. And it's actually kind of a hot debate from what I understand from Southeast Asian experts. How good is Vietnam actually doing? And you got a lot of people who are like, oh, Vietnam is so great. Uh, a lot of places can't even afford air conditioner for 100 million people. So, yikes. Okay, so without further ado, um, the, the real problem here is in the reality. You've got 100 million people that in absolute numbers don't even have an economy of $300 billion, right? And so when you get, in the, or you get into the per capita, right, is that we're talking about an economy that all, largely by absolute numbers is only almost $3,000 per, per year for, for a person. Like, holy crap. Even if you adjust that with PPP, you're still not even into the develop or into the developing world numbers. Uh, this is not good. Now, granted, there's a lot of conversations about... Uh, there is a lot of conversations, to a large degree, about um, what is going on. Um, excuse me for a second here. Um, there's a lot of conversations about how much they actually do, which we already addressed, but uh, we just don't necessarily know because Vietnam doesn't play by the same rules. They've got a lot of things that are considered socialized, but it's a lot of central planning. And while, to some degree, most people have some kind of health care and some kind of education, their general amenities aren't very high. Um, now, granted, we can talk about how much the, the purchasing power does matter here, but this is not enough to run air conditioning in an area that's in the tropics. This is not going to be one of the most pleasant places to live. And so, in a general sense here, sorry, I needed to drink, is that, um, in a general sense here, uh, the economy could be doing a lot better. The good news is it is growing, and it's now attracting a lot more of an attention and investment from American companies and European companies and even some East Asian companies as the world gears up against more or more and more against a uh, ever-growing and ever-belligerent China. And so, uh, as a general level here, um, it's going to be quite interesting to see where that goes. So, um... Let's close out the other two uh, points here, politics and military. Um, and flaws, um, if, I, if I see that I still have a problem, I might do that. Uh, but we haven't seen you for a while, so I, I don't want to jump the gun there. Okay, uh, politically speaking, uh, I don't know a lot about Vietnamese politics. All I can talk about is more of their international politics. They don't like the Chinese at all, and they've largely become buddy buddies with the Americans, even though you know we fought the Vietnamese War against them. They actually view us more as like like oh, inter, inter, excuse me interlopers of circumstance. We had we came here because we had a reason to at the time, and now that that time's over, you know there's no reason to actually you know maintain the hatchet because for all we can say about all the damage we done we did in Vietnam for the United States. Vietnam is just like, you guys? Pfft. We've had China invade us like 10 times. Are you kidding me? This is normal for us. So to a large degree, we've just, you know, we were a one-stop shop where they're looking at China. It's just like, if you do it again, I swear, dude. Um, and so in a general in a general nutshell, at least for me personally, is that the political situation in Vietnam is largely going to revolve around hedging their bets against the Chinese influence in the region, and that means that they're going to buddy up more with Taiwan, with Japan, and maybe even Australia, India, and of course the United States. And they've been making some pretty good overtures. We actually do have a few operating stations within Vietnam. Some of them are foreign offices. Uh, some of them are a little bit of a small military outpost kind of things, like you've got uh, a couple hundred dudes that will, you know, move in a country from time to time. There is supposedly conversations about a base 
an actual full-on base within within the country, but uh, that's been a really bit of a touchy subject because there is still some animosity on both sides regarding the war itself and uh, American foreign policy where people are afraid that literally the next president can come in and undo everything, particularly under in the era just after Donald Trump. And so, well, to close out this, we've got the military um, standing here. Vietnam is you know, it just doesn't have the money to afford a modern military. And even if it had the money to afford a modern military, it doesn't have the terrain to operate a modern military in. At least not the one that we're used to. Uh, mobility warfare, you know, tanks, tanks and artillery and rapid action troops. It's not what Vietnam's good for. Uh, if anything, ironically enough, the best thing they can do is another guerrilla war. And it's not just because of their financial situation, but the this is a topography and a geography and a climate that is really, really built out for defensive and, um, excuse me, defensive and here, um, what's the word here? Defensive warfare and um, non-conventional warfare, particularly in, um, you know, ambush tactics, stuff like that. And so to a large degree, Vietnam's major defense strategy, ironically, is literally come in and we'll kill you slowly. <laughs> and it's not because that's what they necessarily prefer, but it's really hard to oppose the regional powers around them because if you have a navy, you can literally park up shop just about anywhere and everywhere. And then if you are a land power, there's only a few, there's a couple avenues you can go through, but they just don't have the resources to really muster to be able to respond to you in a particular kind. And so, while that only ends up being less than 20 minutes, this has been Country Spotlight on Vietnam. I hope you enjoyed this one, and we'll be doing uh, uh, Laos the next time that we're around. And so, if you have any particular countries that you want me to do, feel free to contact me on Facebook, on LinkedIn, and Twitter. Make sure that I tell you that I, I put it on the list that, hey, I'm going to do this. Oh, yeah, remember, the next one's Aus the, the one that was asked to was Australia. I'll make, make, make the note for that. Anyway, without further ado, I appreciate you all being here, whether you were in the chat watching it live. And do, do remember that if you are watching this on or YouTube, you can come join me live because I do Q&A sessions almost every time that I'm done. Um, and so without further, without further ado, as I've said many times already, <laughs> This is the end of this episode. The stream is not ending, but enjoy the outro and we'll be right back. And uh, we'll be doing another Q&A on Vietnam. So here we go.